Welcome to MUFON Los Angeles. My name is Steve Murillo. I am the State Section Director for MUFON LA. We have a very interesting program. Dr. Nick Begich is with us tonight. And his subject tonight is Controlling the Human Mind, a Brave New World, or Enhancing Human Performance. UFOs are not the only subject that certain elements of the government keep hush-hush. Author and activist Dr. Nick Begich shares his revelations about the impact of new technologies on modern society and the implications for individual freedom. Manipulation of the mind, emotions, and physical health of people through new applied technologies continues to draw the attention of military planners around the world. Dr. Begich will present detailed information and hands-on technology demonstrations in the most startling advances of technology for both military and private sectors, including light sound devices, biofeedback technology, electroacupuncture, and other devices. From his father, the late Alaskan Congressman Dr. Uh, or Nick Begich Sr., and his politi political activist mother, Dr. Begich inherited a proactive spirit and dedication to the truth. He earned his doctorate in traditional medicine from the Open International University of Complementary Medicines in November of 1994, and has been pursuing independent research in the sciences of, and politics for most of his adult life. Dr. Begich's work is characterized by meticulous research and documentation. In addition to co-authoring the groundbreaking book, Angels Don't Play This Harp, and advances in Tesla technology. He is also the co-author of Earth, Earth Rising, The Revolution Toward a Thousand Years of Peace, and his latest book, Earth Rising II, The Betrayal of Science, Society, and, and the Soul. Dr. Begich is the editor of a new science book series called Earth Pulse, Flashpoints, and the publisher and co-owner of Earth Pulse, Earth Pulse Press. Dr. Begich is a well-known international lecturer and has been featured on numerous documentaries and radio broadcasts reporting on his research activities involving new technologies, health, and earth sciences. Would you all well, put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Dr. Nick Begich. Uh, I come from Alaska, and you know we've we've lectured in a lot of different forums. Uh, MUFON has brought us down before. It's been a number of years ago. We appreciate um, being sponsored again to come down and, and share our uh, message uh, with folks in the in the LA area. You know, we started our work um, with HARP, where most of you probably are familiar with some of the things that we've done over the years. You know, and, and HARP was for me at least sort of a beginning point. It was dealing with. Um, technologies that were interesting to me and I had always viewed um, my role eventually as being one of translator. You know people say well you're a scientist and the answer is no I'm not. I am a science translator. You know I read a lot of science, I've read a lot in the sciences, yes I have some academic background there, but it's translating um, complicated science that I think is really important today for lots of different reasons. Um, whether it's the uh, UFO issue or the HARP issue or any of these issues that require a little bit of science understanding and more importantly when you start to think about things in the 21st century affecting um, political systems it is technology in this century that makes government strong. Within democratic republics such as ours um, it is incredibly important uh, for the average citizen at least to have a conceptual knowledge of some of the sciences. And that doesn't mean any more than um, a conceptual knowledge of our automobiles because most of the new ones now none of us can work on. <laughs> it's kind of a, but we can drive them from place to place. We understand how they operate and the same is true uh, with much of our technology. We're a little intimidated by it um, but we shouldn't be. Uh, MUFON has always been sort of a natural fit uh, when you talk about technology issues because you folks are activists you're interested in, you're challenging uh, the status quo. And, and I think that's really what our work has represented over the years is a challenge uh, to the status quo. I'm, in, I'm a, a known for my meticulous footnoting. Anyone who's looked at my printed material know that. Um, in the four books that are over there on the table, there's 1,650 sources that are cited. And these aren't conversations in some phone booth. These are hard documents that you can go put your hands on and draw your own conclusions about. And, and why I think that's important today is there is so much information out there that is um, certainly uh, emotionally charged and, and motivating, but when it's not well documented, we really shouldn't um, alter our behaviors until we see uh, the substance of the material that we're reviewing. And so on that note, uh, we began to pursue uh, technologies first with HARP, 
Um, how many have never heard anything about HARP? You've got to wave your hand around a little bit because otherwise I'm not going to see. I just see a couple going up. Um, so I'm not going to belabor that uh, too much tonight. I'll, I'll mention a couple of things. Uh, we, have a, we have a couple of websites that are important. I'm going to give you a, a catalog at the end of this so you'll have that stuff written down. One is the um, Earth Pulse site, which is our commercial site, but it has a lot of articles that are free. We encourage people to take those, print them, circulate them. Send them to your congressional delegation if they mean something to you. There's a lot of good uh, material there. Um, the other site is the um, layinstitute.org, layinstitute.org. And the Lay Institute um, was set up about three years ago by uh, one of the heirs to Herman Lay. Herman Lay was the gentleman that founded uh, Lay Potato Chips, merged it with Frito, later merged it with PepsiCo, and was their CEO up until his death in the early 80s. Um, one of his daughters, Dorothy Lay, set up an institute essentially to educate people on the impact um, of technologies. Um, I'm serving as a board member. There's three of us on the board and also as executive director of the institute. And so a lot of our research today um, is facilitated through uh, the support we get from the Lay Institute uh, to make sure that these issues do come forward. We're also doing a radio program daily. Some of you may have uh, tuned into that. How many have heard me on um, uh, GCN Live? Anyone in the audience out here? Okay, a few. GCNlive.com. Uh, 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 it's on from 4 till 6 Central Time, five days a week. It's free to listen to live on the web. It's also on shortwave, at least for the next month or so as we test that to see if it's a viable way for us to reach people uh, the short wave is 99.75 and 99.85 um, to listen. We cover primarily technology issues. On the website, earthpulse.com, there are 90 hours of free MP3 files on past radio that we've done. So you can go and catch up on some of the things that we've been uh, dealing with outside of the issues we're going to cover today. The subject of the day, um, I believe, is the most important um, issue that I've covered uh, in my life. Um, it's the idea of mind effects, controlling the human mind. And there's two sides to this question that are extremely um, important. Um, and, and I think for this discussion tonight, uh, we have what, an hour and a half? Is that the deal? I can only go till 9.30. Is that supposed to be the? No, 2.30 if you want to take a break, you have some refreshments. All right. OK, are you guys up till 10.30? Yeah. All right. <laughs> then, then what we'll do is, is we're going to go until um, we feel it's an appropriate place to stop. I don't use a lot of visuals and I don't have a canned script. I never do. Um, but I will keep track of the time and we will take a break so people can uh, get up and stretch um, approximately halfway uh, through, maybe a little after 9 o'clock if that works for everyone. Controlling the human mind, and I want to start with a discussion about sort of how this issue uh, developed for us. Going back to the very beginnings um, with HARP, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project based in Alaska. This is a radio frequency array, a field of antennas. Right now, 180 antennas are in the array. They're approximately 72 feet tall each. Uh, and then they have what's called a cross dipole. So you see a, st a mast coming up and then a cross dipole perpendicular uh, to the mast. And imagine 180 of these in a, in a huge field. They just finished the last environmental um, notices because they're upgrading the power for this fall and that's something they had to give public notice that finished up in late March where that notice was given. Um, but one of the things that came up with HARP was a concept without getting into a lot of the background, just the basic concepts. One of them was something called earth penetrating uh, tomography. In plain language or by way of analogy or comparison it would be like um, x-raying the earth by analogy, looking into the earth several kilometers deep. But instead of x-rays, uh, what they would be using is radio frequency energy that was modulated uh, in such a way that it, once it hit the ionosphere, they could pump energy into the ionosphere, which is a layer that begins approximately 30 miles above the Earth's surface. The ionosphere then begins to um, resonate in harmony with the pulse rate. In other words, it begins to act like a giant broadcast antenna in the sky and it sends back an ELF, an extremely low frequency, um, very long wavelength back to the earth and it takes a very long wavelength to penetrate the earth and sea and then a certain amount of the energy is reflected back and then from that reflection you can deduce and determine exactly what the ground strata looks like underneath. Now they tested this um, in Alaska um, back in 1996, it was part of the non-proliferation and counter-proliferation of nuclear weapons where HARP was funded that year to prove this concept would work because it was after the uh, 
the first Gulf War where people were concerned about underground facilities and this concept came up. Well, the frequency range for earth penetrating tomography happens to be 1 uh, to 20 hertz or 1 to 20 pulses or vibrations per second. Now, why is that important? Well, it happens to correlate to the predominant brain activity of human beings. And if you go back, if you go back um, quite a ways in history, uh, you can go back to the work of uh, J.F. Gordon MacDonald. And J.F. Gordon MacDonald um, developed a number of ideas. Uh, he was a geophysicist here at UCLA. He was also a science advisor to Lyndon Johnson. In 1969, he wrote a, um, a chapter for a book. The book was called Unless Peace Comes, and the chapter was called How to Wreck Your Environment. Now, that was before Earth Day, which we had a few weeks ago. But the idea was, uh, within this, was this discussion about if we could ever figure out how to stroke the ionosphere in just the right way, we could return a signal to the Earth that would manipulate those in contact with the signal. The same was echoed um, by Zbigniew Brzezinski in his book Between Two Ages, which he published in the early 1970s when he was still at Columbia University, about the time he was forming up the Trilateral Commission with Kissinger and Rockefeller, and just before he became National Security Advisor uh, to President Carter, and he echoed the same idea. In 1995, about the time that we published the Hart book, a guy named Persinger at Laurentian University in Canada came out with a very similar statement suggesting that if we could manipulate the magnetic field lines that surround the earth that we could in fact um, uh, manipulate the emotional states of people over huge uh, geographic areas. Now the way they envisioned this happening was through something that's called frequency following response or also referred to as brain entrainment. And what this says essentially is that external fields, oscillating fields that are within certain ranges will couple uh, with the human brain in such a way that the brain begins a frequency following response. It begins to mirror um, the pulse rate of those external signals. Now this is something well known um, in the literature, lots of different ways to do this. But what Persinger was talking about, what Zbigniew Brzezinski was talking about, what J.F. Gordon MacDonald was talking about was using um, the earth itself as sort of the carrier uh, for that signal. HARP was the first time that we had developed a system big enough and flexible enough uh, to carry out that kind of activity. That's what first got me focused on this issue. And I'm going to lay aside all of the other HARP um, issues because they're not um, a subject for tonight. And I think we lectured on that when we were here years ago um, when we first appeared uh, at, for LA uh, MUFON. But looking at this concept became uh, disheartening for me in a lot of different ways because as I looked at the research and was interested in this field, it really was from the standpoint originally going back to the 1980s and early 1990s, my interest was enhancing human performance. In other words, using things like the frequency following response for increasing the potentials of what we might be uh, capable of as human beings. That was my area of interest. Um, that whole idea um, that we could, in fact, advance ourselves in tremendous ways with augmentation of a little bit of equipment, much in the same way as we could get here today by flying on an airplane instead of figuring out a way to flap my arms and make it work. Technology, um, as it's been applied in this area, and I'm going to go back first historically, we'll talk about the dark side of this, and then we'll flip it around and talk about some of the other things that are out there as uh, we look at the human mind. But going back historically, the issue of mind control, um, or what many are referring to now as mind effects, because whether it's to just stimulate some effect for control purposes or whether it's to enhance someone's performance, mind effects are really what we're talking about. Going back historically, you can start with hip, hip, hypnosis. Back in the 1880s when people were really starting to get into this issue and study it, up until the 1920s, Harvard in fact had a research lab set up just to study hypnosis. A guy named uh, George Estabrooks was working in the 1920s in this lab and had determined at that time that about one in five people could be taken into such a profound state of hypnotic trance that you could literally take them down to that level, split the personality into two very unique individuals, one with full knowledge of the other and the other with no knowledge of the other. And his concept was to create a super spy, what we would call today in the literature a Manchurian candidate. You know, somebody that you could send in that could function in a, in a, in a, third, uh, a second country, third country, um, if they were ever captured or detected, they would have no recollection of their full history. It would take about nine to ten months 
to condition and train someone in order for them to be in this position. By the 1930s, mid-1930s, Estabrook's work was classified. Now, the next place um, that he shows up is 1943. He wrote a classic, a book called Hypnotism that was later revised in 1957. Um, the next book he wrote in 1947, extremely interesting, called Spiritism. And it was his view that uh, spiritualism, which was being practiced um, a, a lot in the 40s, it was a big deal, it was like a trendy kind of thing to be involved in through the 20s, 30s, and into the 40s. He viewed it as not something coming in from external, but an amplification of some aspect of the individual's personality. That was his twist on it as he wrote this book. His last book, the most important one I think he wrote, um, was um, The Future of the Human Mind from the early 1960s. Now, when you look at his work and you think about it and you look at what he was doing in research and you parallel it to the same things that were being looked at by other organizations like the Mankind Research Institute, and I'll talk about them in a minute, as well as the Central Intelligence Agency in the United States, you see a lot of parallels. Um, a couple of things also show up in Estabrook's work, and it's fairly consistent with a lot of these guys, is this sort of excusing of their behavior. In other words, yeah, we're getting involved in this, but it's not the scientist that's responsible for what happens, it's the other guy. And ladies and gentlemen, it's the scientist who's responsible for what happens when their creative um, work is used in an inappropriate way, uh, especially when they have choices. And most of these guys have choices. They, they decide what they're going to support. And in Estabrook's case, in the early 60s, he was suggesting, for instance, things like LSD be used therapeutically um, in, 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 uh, in, in, with psychologists and, um, and behaviorists. You think about that. You know, not, today we would kind of laugh about it. You know, it's kind of ridiculous. But they took it very seriously. And the CIA was involved in this. There was actually a report. It was prepared. Um, it was a report to the President of the United States. It was uh, authored by the Commission on CIA Activities within the United States. It's dated June 1975. You can go look it up. Um, it's interesting because it dealt with a lot more than just mind control as a subject. Um, although I want to mention this because it was written um, in the mid-70s, it was right after Watergate when there was a lot of concern about what else the CIA might be doing. And remember, it was supposedly ex-CIA guys that broke into the Watergate. Are there any ex-CIA guys? I don't think so. Um, but the fact is, CIA got analyzed and looked at very carefully. And what we found was that they were infiltrating um, community groups and individual groups in the United States, opening domestic mail, tapping phone lines and experimenting on uh, men and women, both um, unwitting uh, victims and military service personnel. And this all came out in this presidential report. And it kind of set the stage for things like the Freedom of Information Act of 1976 and a few other things that in the last um, 20, 30 years we've watched get eroded. And in fact, we find ourselves almost in exactly the same place as we were in the late 60s, early 70s. The only difference is the technologies of today are dramatically more powerful uh, than what was possible then. Uh, I bring that up a little bit too. His uh, dad was in the Congress um, back in those days, 1971. He was elected uh, to the 92nd Congress. Um, he disappeared on a plane with Hale Boggs just before Watergate broke, three weeks before the second election of um, Richard Nixon. Boggs was the majority leader in the House. Many will remember that um, disappearance. It was never recovered. Um, yet there were some things that have been raised in recent years that have suggested that maybe there was more to it than meets the eye. Boggs was a Warren Commissioner. He wanted the Warren Commission reopened. Um, he had a strong dislike, disdain, um, is probably a better word for the FBI, and be because they had become systemically corrupted. Um, he had very great level of distrust for the American uh, national security apparatus, uh, and for good reason. He was tired of his phone lines being tapped, all of his colleagues being tapped, and people like um, J. Edgar Hoover, when he was still breathing, being able to manipulate the Congress based on essentially blackmail. Um, that was the state of things uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. The research in mind control, when you look at uh, the report on the CIA activities uh, done by the President's Commission, one of the things that comes out is what they were doing right here in California. In the late 50s, uh, the CIA, working with the FBI, in cooperation with them, were working to try these various techniques on unwitting victims, which included felons that were out on parole. It included um, people that were isolated from one another that didn't have strong family ties. And the FBI was the vehicle um, by which, according to um, that report on the CIA, was used to sort of find those unwitting victims. The thing about it is, it wasn't just a few people. It involved 
thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of individuals. The other thing that comes out um, in all of that research, in fact, uh, it was uh, O'Leary during the Clinton administration that announced that over a half a million Americans had been victimized by human experimentation in the United States without their consent. Now, this included everything from syphilis being injected into black Americans in the southeast to radioactive iodine in indigenous Alaskans to LSD, uh, ketamine, telepathine, BZ, and other things being used on American servicemen and women. Um, to kind of prove up what was possible. Now when you think about all this, and where did, where did our government really get excited was right after the Korean conflict. Right after the Korean conflict, we had men returning uh, as prisoners of war that had been subjected to all kinds of unusual conditions, but they went from these patriotic kind of people to guys handing out communist leaflets on street corners. And that's, in the early 50s, is where we got the words or the phrase brainwashing. And that was from this observation of Korean war veterans and at that point is when our government got heavily engaged and it was in the 50s, late 50s that we were doing this work on the west coast. In Canada they worked with a guy named Cameron who was um, working in one of the um, state-run psychiatric hospitals in, Can in Canada. The CIA did settle with those victims, a number of them, 80 of them, um, paid settlements out to them for their abuse that they had sustained as well as the Canadian government. Yet in the U.S., only one victim has ever been compensated, and it was one of the guys involved in the research um, that had been given LSD, um, had committed suicide, or was pushed. They never really um, isolated that, but he fell out of a floor in New York City and died um, while on LSD as part of that experiment. Now, that was the old MK Ultra experiments, and many of you have heard about them. The New York Times reported on one of the most famous um, M MK Ultra test subjects um, after he was caught, and that was the Unabomber. And many remember the Unabomber. The New York Times said he was a victim of MK Ultra while he was at Harvard University as a student. And maybe that had something to do with his dislike for the academic world, because that's who he attacked. If you stop and think about it, he was really warring against technology and academics. Did it start with that program or? Was that just a reflection of his personality? I suppose we, we may never know, but it would be nice to know who all of these victims, um, experimental subjects were, and whether or not others have displayed similar uh, antisocial um, behaviors. But going back uh, again to this early period, the use of drugs was used um, extensively. Other things that were used um, included electronic devices, although they didn't make much um, in the congressional reports. And part of that was those congressional reports, when they were convened, the CIA was busy shredding uh, piles of files, and it was years later that through the accounting records of the CIA were people able to piece together a lot of what um, had happened. But in all of that, you know, everyone thinks about controlling people as really where this projects and these projects were going. We're about how to manipulate people in such a way as to get them to do certain things. But it was much more than that. In the last few months, as I've looked at the issue more intensely, um, I've determined that it's probably had more to do uh, with consciousness, the analysis and study of human consciousness, and the latent capacities of human beings that were being discovered that, quite frankly, scared the hell out of uh, the military establishment. I mean, things like um, telekinesis, telepathy, things that we call, um, in the old days, we used to call ESP. Today they call anomalous human capabilities. That's how it shows up in, in the military literature. It's creative, but I mean, it says the same message. But what they discovered was that some of these things could be stimulated. Um, and they were using drugs um, and many other ways of doing it. And I think once they recognized the potentials, it really scared them. And I'll, and I'll tell you why um, in, in a few minutes. But going back to sort of the history of this, uh, MKUltra and its 140 plus sub-projects all kind of ran um, independent tracks for the Central Intelligence Agency. That's who ran them. A guy named Helms was at the helm uh, in the Central Intelligence Agency doing most of this. <coughs> most will remember, <clears throat> and maybe you won't, but um, right after all of the scandals with the Central Intelligence Agency, does anybody remember who came in to clean up the mess? It was George Bush Sr was director of Central Intelligence during the years of supposedly the cleanup, which gave him immediate and, and clear access to all of what was um, happening within the institution. The reason I bring it up is it was the Bush-Reagan administration that really resurrected a lot of this research. It became much more intense. Um, 
Even today, we see a lot more in this area, and I'm going to reference a couple of things um, that, that get this up into the uh, current frame. And I just grabbed a stack of files. You know, we got piles of files, my wife will tell you. It's the, the most miserable part of our house, <laughs> she'll tell you. But uh, the miles of piles of files, and instead of bringing a lot of visual material, I just bring a, a couple of things uh, to bring some of this into perspective, at least. Uh, for the sake of everyone here. I had mentioned Zbigniew Brzezinski's book, Between Two Ages. This is a book you can find um, in most good libraries. There was over 170,000 published, so you can still find this book. I'd really recommend that you read it. And the reason I suggest it is it is a history, if you read it today, although it was written in the early 70s, of what has happened in the last 35 years in terms of economics, technology, um, politics, discussing what happened in Asia, Eastern Europe, Africa, the Americas, um, Europe. I mean, the world is defined um, maybe as a road map rather than a prediction. But take a look at it. You'll find it interesting. Um, and on page 54 to 56 of that book is where it gets into these mind control technologies. Um, one of the other places where it jumps out, and I want to I show this, The Economist, May 25th, 2002. This was their cover, The Future of mind control. And what they talked about here was the ethics of where this technology uh, was going. The um, report, the June 1975 report to the President, Commission uh, on Sea Activities within the United States, that's the cover of that document that I was just referencing. A good one to find if you've got a good academic library and you do in this area, you can find this document. I'd suggest you do and you take a look at it because the same things are happening um, again. Um, one of the early researchers, and I want to mention him because I can't forget uh, the, this guy, um, Jose Delgado, he wrote the book Physical Control of the Mind Toward a Psycho-Civilized Society. This is 1969 vintage. He was, um, uh, had his degree in electrophysiology from the University of Madrid from uh, 1950. He worked at Yale University in the area of um, mind uh, effects. He was actually mapping the brain uh, in the 1960s and 70s, determining what portions of the brain were responsible for what, and then using um, electrodes pl implanted in the brain, stimulating the brains of uh, primates and animals to determine what, uh, what you could do. By the mid-80s, he had determined that you didn't need any implanted technology whatsoever. In fact, all as you needed was radio frequency energy modulated in a very precise way, but at an energy strength or density of one fiftieth of what the Earth naturally produces. Now let me put that in perspective. Natural radio frequency energy from the Earth, man produces 200 million times more, surrounds us right now, than nature creates. So one ten billionth of what nature creates, the body and mind is able to pick out RF, radio frequency energy, in a very precise range, like dialing through the radio station until you get resonance between a transmitter and receiver, so is the same with the human brain. When you hit that station, if you will, you get resonance and you get a nice clear signal and an energy exchange that takes place. What he determined was at one fiftieth of what the Earth naturally produces, you could man maneuver the man emotional state of humans and primates like flipping on and off a light switch from passive to highly aggressive, back and forth. Just using RF, no implants, no anything. Now why is that important? Well, when you look at the HARP system, and the HARP system, and this is a graphic taken uh, from uh, Bernard Eastland's um, designs, who was a inventor of the system, an array or field of antennas focusing energy to the ionosphere into a relatively small area. This is the opposite of what we normally think of when we think of radio frequency uh, energy coming off of an antenna. We think about it in the same way as if I take a, a light, a flashlight, and I shine it on the wall, the beam starts out small and widens out. Well, this is the opposite. And the reason it is the opposite is the way they fire this array, they create a cyclotron resonance, a corkscrewing kind of motion that focuses the energy to a relatively small area, and then by pulsing the energy, the ionosphere begins to return a signal back to the Earth. What, what happens is the brain will lock on to that signal, and I'll cover this uh, briefly, this kind of range. Uh, from one to four hertz or pulses per second, this is where you are in the deepest state of sleep. It's called the delta state. When you're deeply, deeply asleep, you'll be in that delta state. 
The theta range above that is where you're more or less actively dreaming. Um, the higher end of theta is where you are when you're sort of awake and asleep at the same time, where you're consciously aware of your dreams. This is also where three to five year olds, three to six year olds spend most of their time. <laughs> Explains a lot if you've been around little kids. You know, about figuring out what's real, what's imaginary. You know, we all go through that dialogue with kids because that's where they're at. And what do we do with them in the United States? We shove them into these academic learning frames that quite frankly the brain is not developed enough at that age to accommodate. And so then they get very frustrated and they act out and we think they have attention deficit disorders or hyperactivity and we start pumping them up full of drugs because they, they need to calm down or they need to speed up or whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish. Instead of recognizing what Europeans have recognized for years, they don't start kids in academic learning till they're seven. And the reason is at seven, it's the next level of brain activity that tends to dominate, which is the alpha range, which is where you are when you're in that ideal zone, that focused attention, that creative place. And this is approximately, excuse me, theta would be approximately four to uh, seven hertz, and then uh, alpha approximately seven to 11 or 12 hertz. And then above that, the beta ranges, which are where I hope most of you are, unless I put someone to sleep. Um, but more or less, that's where most of us are in our waking uh, state. Although we drop into the alpha range fairly frequently. The thing about these external signals is the brain recognizes them and begins to mirror them in a frequency following response. Now you can use RF, like what Delgado did or what HARP can produce. And HARP will produce 50 times more energy density than is necessary according to the inventors in terms of a return signal. So it's only a matter of hitting the right frequency, either purposefully or by mistake, as a side effect, if you will, where these kinds of effects can occur. Persinger talked about it at Laurentian University. Many other researchers have covered this idea, but you can use radio frequency. You can use electro, um, electrocranial stimulation. How many have ever seen that utilized? Okay, I get, I get to tell you about it. Electrocranial stimulation would be using um, a, a, an electric current that you would have electrodes generally placed here and then right behind the ears. And what happens is, is you get a pulse modulation of an electromagnetic field that covers the uh, exterior of the, of the head, but you can feel it. And actually the brain activity, if you were to monitor it, you would see it mirror that signal. So you can run it, say, into a, an alpha state for focused learning and concentration, you know, these kinds of things. The problem is you use GUI electrodes, and I personally don't care for those so much, but other systems have been developed. Um, how many have heard of a binaural or bioral beat? Okay, there's a few hands that go up. The human ear cannot hear in the ELF range, yet this is the range where the brain is active. We can't hear a signal of, say, 20 hertz or below. We, we can't hear that low. Um, you know, you think about it, it doesn't mean the sound isn't there, we just can't perceive it. It's like a, a dolphin can hear up to 250,000 cycles or pulses per second. A human being can hear up to about 24,000. The dolphin hears 10 times as much as we do. Does it mean the sound isn't there? No, it's just our perception is, is limited. So how do you get an ELF signal that can be perceived or will affect the brain? And this technique was actually developed by a guy named Robert Monroe. Robert Monroe developed um, Hemisync. Um, which is a way of creating a bioral beat. And Hemisync does something uh, quite different. What it does, this is kind of a graphic of a, of a normal brain where you have energy distributions shown in color spread across the brain. Um, generally, you get one side that's got a lot of activity, one that doesn't, you know, right brain, left brain kind of discussions that we've all heard before creative and analytical, you know, little girls are more creative, little boys are more analytical, it used to be that way, it's not anymore. Now we, we make them all a little bit analytical and we really destroy some things because the way the brain works when you're young, when you're a little kid and we haven't gone in and tried to make them um, Albert Einstein's when they still need to be finger painting, <laughs> you know, and learning social skills and language and all the things kids learn between three and seven, um, they tend to show a more balanced uh, brain. Now this, not nearly like this. This is, um, this is hemisync in action. This is where bioral bead is created within the brain where both hemispheres begin to balance the energy right and left and work together. This is the way I believe the brain was originally intended uh, to operate, where both sides contribute to one another in a way that gets you the best. The best creativity and the best analytical uh, view of what's going on within those creative processes. Little kids <coughs> you'll see with um, 
much more balance between the hemispheres and as we educate them they drift one side or the other and this is the way we condition uh, the child actually uh, to go one way or the other. The, the thing about it with uh, Monroe, what he found is you could send a signal in at say 15,000 uh, cycles or 15,000 hertz in one ear and say 15,007 in the other ear. You take 15,000 off of 15,007 and you have a difference of seven and what would happen is they kind of cancel within the cranium and set up a beat frequency of seven hertz which the mind recognizes as an alpha rhythm, you get a whole brain effect with an alpha rhythm. And there's also, um, what they did is look at the brain activity of hundreds of people and embed also a signal that would give you a mirror of the mean. So that if you wanted, for instance, accelerated learning applications for focus concentration, you can use a headset, create a bioral beat, the mind will go into this condition and you'll be able to absorb the written material that you're reading much more effectively as an example. Or for things like sleep, being able to slow the brain down or stimulate creative aspects of the brain. But Monroe did incredible work uh, in this area, but he used bioral beat as the vehicle and you just have to use a standard headset, not, a, not one of these Bose can noise canceling headsets because you'll lose a lot of the information when you use them. Important technology because it's simple and yet when you start to think about brain entrainment, one of the other things that came out was f the flicker effect from light. How many have ever experimented with light and sound devices? Okay, I've got a couple hands going up. Um, in fact, one of the guys in the back said he just tried one in the last month and was pretty surprised at what, what it would do. But flickering light, unless you have a history of brain disorders, particularly epilepsy, you cannot use these kinds of devices. <laughs> But assuming that everything is normal, flickering light will create the same entrainment effect where the brain will then begin to mirror the external signal and obviously flickering light can be irritating. The way these systems are designed is you actually close the eyes, the light penetrates the eyelids, the brain entrains to that light within a very few uh, moments. Usually within 20, 30 seconds you'll begin to entrain to that external signal. When you use it in combination with light and sound, you get a very incredible um, effect. Now, a lot of the devices now, you can actually jack in um, your own affirmations, or put yourself into a suggestive state, give yourself your own coaching, if you will, because those are the words you trust the most, um, your own. Subliminal should be avoided, and I'll tell you why. If I say the word dog in a room like this, and I say how many feel good about it, a lot of people's hands will go up, feel warm and fuzzy. A few hands will go up saying, I'm scared to death of dogs for whatever experiences you might have had. Words are your symbols for relevant information. If you use subliminals that conflict or set up conflict in your belief systems, you can create some serious damage, some serious damage. You need to know what's on any subliminal, absolutely know what's on it to make sure that the beliefs or systems that are being suggested to you line up with your own belief systems and don't create underlying conflicts. Underlying conflicts and belief systems at the subconscious level are the root to a lot of forms of psychoses. So you want to be very careful. Why I like hemisync is they're all overt. You hear the words when they use them. Most of their stuff is either word oriented with music background or it's straight sound just to create a, um, a specific effect. But again, you need to be careful because all these things are very powerful. They, they do work um, and you just don't want to play with them and you certainly don't want people um, imposing them on you. But I want to talk a little bit more about the history and some things that are showing up uh, more recently as, as we relate uh, to this whole area. And I'm going to use some of the things that are in my archives and I pulled some files um, and just to kind of discuss the variety of places. Uh, this particular document is from um, FBIS in Reston, Virginia. FBIS is a Federal Bureau of Information Services. How many have ever heard about them? Don't see any hands going up. These are, uh, it's an organization run by the Central Intelligence Agency and what their job is is to grab all the printed media um, that's out there, news broadcasts, and translate them and make them available to the agencies that would need them. In this case, they translated um, a, a Russian military surgeon's journal um, talking about new weapons concepts. And the reason I bring it up, it's declassified in January 2001. It was originally um, published uh, May of 1998. Um, and it talks about the uh, Chinese um, initiatives in these areas, which included things like um, 
using uh, small amounts of, I'll just read you a couple of quotes, that lay it all out. A small amount of output power can induce immeasurable fear and cause mass hysteria. A large amount of output power can cause unstable mental states, body malfunction, or even symptoms of mental diseases. These are some of the things they attribute to infrasound uh, technologies. These are technologies below the level of hearing that still have these kinds of profound um, effects. They go into discussing microwave weapons with similar effects, um, particle beam weapons, um, incoherent light sources even um, being utilized. But in all of their discussion, essentially what this is about is energy being the medium for creating tremendous effects. And that paper, the Chinese paper, doesn't just talk about physiological effects on humans, they talk about being able to affect environmental systems as well. And that's a subject, uh, that side of the subject is for another day. But I want to talk about um, a couple of other uh, issues that come up. This is a very important um, RFP, Request for Proposal. This is by the um, Air Force Research Laboratory. It's from the, uh, it's Research in Support of Directed Energy Bioeffects Division of the Human Effectiveness Directorate. It's their contract BAA 05-05-HE. And it doesn't expire until September 30th, 2009. So this is going to be the most current document that I quote from today, because it's still active. And I want to quote on what their ultimate goal is. The ult and I'm quoting, uh, the ultimate goal of such uh, map, excuse me, the ultimate goal of such research is to develop a fully articulated theory with supporting predictive models that will facilitate the inducement of desired behavioral effects in individuals and groups through the use of non-lethal weapons. In other words, when you review this RFP, what it's talking about is trying to find out those ways that you can override the human brain and create specific and deliberate behavioral changes. Now, the, 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 an earlier uh, document where this concept was kicked around is a publication. This is Air Force Research Laboratories uh, Technology Horizons. This is the June uh, 2004 um, issue, and I'm going to read a couple of lines from it to give it some relevance, but this is by the Directed Energy Directorate at Kirtland Air Force Base. This is a group that deals with these types of technologies. Um, there are several papers, there's another one, Low Intensity Conflict in Modern Technology from Maxwell Air Force Base from the mid-80s that gets into this issue also in a section called Electromagnetic Effects. But I want to read just a couple of, um, of, of quotes out of this article. The first one with the advent of directed energy and other revolutionary technology, the ability to instantaneously, instantaneously project very precise amounts of various types of energy anywhere in the world can become a reality. The controlled effects long-term technology challenge embodies this vision. Targets of military significance include facilities, equipment, and personnel, and communications and information systems. It goes on to say, and I quote, Controlled personnel effects investigates technology to make selected adversaries think and act according to our needs. Dominant remote control seeks to control at a distance an enemy's vehicles, sensors, communications, and information systems and manipulate the systems for military purposes. And the last quote from this article that's relevant, um, by studying and modeling the human brain the ner and nervous system, the ability to mentally influence or confuse personnel is possible. Through sensory deception, it may be possible to create synthetic images or holograms to confuse an individual's visual sense or in a similar manner, confuse his senses of sound, taste, touch, smell, etc." Unquote. What they're talking about within this article called controlled effects is how to manipulate deliberately what goes on within our minds to the point where we couldn't distinguish the real from the synthesized. Now why is that important? How many have read anything about per, per, uh, Persinger's work? How many have read Persinger's work on um, uh, magnetic field effects for stimulating things like out of body or um, abduction experiences? Anybody read any of that material? Yes. Okay. Persinger was able to take people within a laboratory environment, he made a helmet that was set up with a bunch of magnetic solenoids that he could trigger in certain ways, and people would have these complete experiences that were, I mean, down to those fine details that we, we hear reported on abductions and out of body. Now, Persinger's conclusion, and I believe he jumped to the conclusion, was, see, it doesn't mean anything. Well, I don't believe that. Um, I, I don't think we can come to any conclusion except, okay, we can stimulate this effect. 
I mean, that, that's the conclusion we can come to. What is that effect? Does it mean that somehow consciously we pierce some veil? You know, is, is our reality just this physical framework? I mean, we just talked about sound a minute ago. You know, there's a lot more sound in our environment than we ever perceive. There's a lot more of everything that we never perceive. You know, from our visual sense, you know, some, they're talking about augmenting sight these days so that we can get the infrared and the ultraviolet and all of this, you know, increase the spectrum of vision. You know, some creatures can already do this. But the question becomes is, did Persinger just stimulate something chemically within the brain or did he stimulate something that linked that individual to some other dimension of reality? Now, if you read some of the more advanced physics that's being fielded um, mainly out of the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, out of Russia today, um, you might come to a much different conclusion. Perhaps it, it stimulated a gateway. Uh, perhaps it opened uh, a gateway into some other uh, dimension of reality. And, and I say the jury's out because I don't think we can jump to any conclusions except to say that we observe these effects. I think that's fair enough. But when you look at it, again, and I want to mention a, another guy's work, Alexander K. Varenin. And Alexander K. Varenin, um, look him up on a Google. And you don't have to worry about the spelling now if you look it up on a Google. K. Varenin with a K. And you'll find Alex's site. He's a, he was a former head of the biophysics lab for the uh, USSR Academy of Sciences for 10 years um, before the fall of the Soviet Union. He spent six weeks with Sheila and I in our home uh, in Alaska when he was perfecting some of his ideas. And he has some very interesting formulas now on his website um, where he has broken down, um, in terms of physics, the formulas that he believes are responsible uh, for, for things like telekinesis and mental telepathy, as an example. Giving the mathematics to it, giving it some substance um, that maybe it didn't have before. I'm going to jump just a little bit because I want to talk about um, some things that we did uh, bef before, we, be before we take a break. I want to talk about um, a conference that we held in Dallas. It was a closed conference. It was not open to the public. Um, we invited a number of people. This was sponsored by the Lay Institute on Technologies. It was our first major project and we, Dorothy really has an affinity for this issue of mind effects because we believe that it is perhaps the most dangerous and at the same time the most important uh, technology being advanced right now. And so we agreed to, to consider putting together this uh, meeting and we spent some time thinking about who would we invite and the rule was, the first rule was, I had to know them and have followed their work for about 10 years or more. I had to watch them fall, in other words, fail somehow or be, a, be nailed somehow and, and gone through some crisis in their career where they had to come out of it and still maintain their integrity. Because as we know, it's not during the good times that integrity is tested. It's when you're getting your rear end kicked, <laughs> when you find out what people are made of. And so each of these guys, um, men and women, had, ex had, had demonstrated that. None of them, uh, per se, I think two of them had met each other before, but otherwise they didn't know each other. Um, we brought them together in this meeting in Dallas. They all came as volunteers. We covered their costs to get them there, but they volunteered their time preparing. And I'm going to give you the list of who was there. Um, and the issue was mind effects, mind control. That was the, the nature of this conference. Now we tape recorded, audio recorded the first day sessions. Um, we excluded one hour and a half section of that first day where we had people with medical conditions come in and talk to us and that was you know, taken off of the recordings because obviously you don't want to talk about people's medical histories um, in, in a public scenario. But the audio tapes for the rest of that day will be made available for free on the layinstitute.org site in the coming weeks. It's taken us a little longer to get that up but it'll be an mp3 file so you can pull them down, get them around, circulate them. The next day we did um, presentations and there were seven presentations, six of the presenters signed full releases and they were videotaped and those will be available for free on the internet. And I want to talk first about who was there and, and, and what we, who we brought together to begin to deal with this uh, issue. And it was probably, in fact I would say, uh, the, the most important group on the mind effects issue ever brought together outside of government. The first person um, I invited was Alexander K. Varenin, who I just described a little bit about Alex, a brilliant guy, um, probably one of the brightest, one of the top two or three biophysicists in the world. Um, has an IQ of over uh, 200. Um, as a young kid, he became very fascinated with parapsychology. He had watched a demonstration in the USSR, 
at 13, 14 years old. It absolutely captured his imagination. He's now 61, and he spent the rest of his life trying to figure it out. And on his website has posted what he believes is the mathematical formulas for discussing exactly why those phenomena occur. More importantly, when he did the math, and he's breaking out all of the equations, and you get down to that kind of that final number, and he got to the final number, and he couldn't believe the number that appeared. And so he reran the calculations over and over again, and the number kept appearing as the root. And the root number that appeared in all of his calculations was the golden mean. That's pretty significant because almost every living thing in some way or another demonstrates in its form the golden mean. It, the Great Pyramid uh, demonstrates the golden mean. All of the great cathedrals of the Middle Ages demonstrate this mathematical principle. It shows up all over the place in virtually every culture, in nature, and here it is at the root of these unusual properties that human beings uh, exhibit, according to Alex. Now, Alex's presentation was probably the most difficult to understand. It is not going to be available until he perfects um, a couple of things he has in intellectual properties trying to get taken care of, copyrights that he feels he needs to get cleared up, and some patents that he needs to finish. But this technology, this idea of um, mental telepathy as, a, as an event, one of the other people that we had at this conference was Elizabeth Rauscher. How many have ever heard about Elizabeth Rauscher or Bill Bice? Not anyone. Man. 273 published papers in her career. Her first one at 15 was immediately classified. It was in nuclear physics. She then worked her summers during high school at Lawrence Livermore Labs and then went to Berkeley. Um, eventually got her PhD in physics back in the 1950s, which for a woman in physics today is tough enough. I can tell you in the 1950s it was not an easy accomplishment. She had to be better uh, than anybody else to make it through that program, and she did. She um, did the first major work on mind effects of anyone back in the 1980s um, that was doing it privately. She demonstrated in a lab environment with 100% accuracy mental telepathy using um, an electronic uh, device to receive an electronic device to send uh, brainwave data through the ether, through the air that could be reconfigured by another individual, and they did it. Um, it brought a lot of um, notoriety to them. They were trying to get this issue addressed. They were concerned about mind control generally as an issue. They were lobbying the Congress actively uh, in 1985 after this set of experiments, and they had done 200 field um, experiments on environmental factors affecting human behavior. We're very much convinced that this needed to be addressed. They were approached on the uh, steps of the Capitol building in Washington in the middle of their lobbying by a guy named Captain uh, Paul Tyler. Before he died, he was a colonel, but he was one of the, if not the, premium uh, researcher pushing these issues uh, for the military in those days. And what happened is they said basically all their government grants, Elizabeth had uh, degrees in biophysics, geophysics, and astrophysics. Brilliant person, and all of their grants stopped, all of their research stopped, all of their commercial enterprises were crushed, and they reclused into um, the western states uh, for the next 20 years. When I approached Elizabeth on getting involved in the issue again, because she is one of the best in the field, she'd already lost her husband two years before, natural causes, but you know that's a tough thing to take when you've been with someone a long time doing work with them. But she felt it was the time uh, to come forward on this issue, and so she agreed to attend and participate in our meeting and did. The next uh, person we invited was Garth Nicholson. How many have heard Garth Nicholson before? He's over here in Huntington Beach, not far from you. He was um, at Tech University of Texas for um, many years. He was a, a full professor. He taught over a thousand medical doctors um, in terms of their medical uh, coursework. He is one of the uh, most published scientists in the world, over 550 published papers. He was a guy that testified six times in front of the Congress on Gulf War Syndrome. He worked close to um, uh, Joyce Riley when they were first taking on that issue of Gulf War Syndrome. And so he attended our meeting as well. The, the next person we invited was Rosalie Bertel. Uh, Rosalie is a, um, a PhD in mathematics. She used to teach um, doctoral candidates at Berkeley uh, mathematics uh, in biology, the biological sciences. So she also had to learn a good deal there. She is, um, was the expert person, the main person sent into Bhopal uh, to look at what had happened there. Her main 
claim to fame is she represents um, victims in radiological nuclear experiments. She's also been very active in the DU uh, area, depleted uranium area, but primarily her history is representing um, victims, and she was in attendance with us. She's also testified with me in the European Parliament years ago on non-lethal weapons and HARP. The next uh, persons that we in invited uh, was um, a Dr. Anu Michaela, who is the daughter of the late uh, Reho Michaela, one of my mentors in uh, the sciences, and her husband, uh, Levon Gasperi, and both of them sit on the board of, um, I forget the name of the organization in Europe, but it's the one that regulates medical applications of lasers. They developed um, a number of methods for uh, electrolaser uh, treatments uh, for chronic disorders and diseases. So they were uh, presenting and also participating. Um, and then we had um, one of my good friends, a, a friend from Alaska, his uh, fourth generation banking family, uh, Dave Cuddy, retired from the bank uh, as a film production studio in Austin, and he volunteered his film crews to film that second day of presentations on the mind effects issues. Uh, we also had, and the last player that we invited was Dr. Bernard Eastland, who invented the HARP system. And all of his um, secrecy arrangements with uh, ARCO uh, Power Technologies and the old Atlantic Richfield has since expired. Um, he's become much more able to communicate on these issues and um, quite frankly the mind control side of the HARP equation is something he just did not uh, relate to. It was not in his academic background, wasn't part of his uh, makeup. But we brought all these guys together to get around this issue to begin a process of taking it forward in a much more credible way to try and get this issue in front of the Congress in the same way that we got it in front of the European Parliament uh, years ago. In fact, in, in the European Parliament, we were able to get a resolution passed. It was their resolution A4-00054 uh, uh, forward slash 1999. And in uh, section 27, well, actually, section 24, 25, and 26 all dealt with HARP based on our testimony uh, in front of the European Parliament. And this was in the biggest security and disarmament resolution they ever passed, uh, since or before in the European Parliament. And in Section 27, and I quote, it calls for an international convention introducing a global ban on all developments and deployments of weapons which might enable any form of manipulation of human beings, unquote. Now, to convince uh, a political body that this was a real issue was the first hurdle because we had to demonstrate um, the possibilities. And we took with us a working model of an infrasound device where we actually made that demonstration. We also took with us three feet of documents that were unclass unclassified documents uh, over four trips into Europe. We were initially supported by conservatives, later the um, Social Democrats and Greens, and we formed a coalition. So by the end of the day, um, these resolution sections passed by the highest margins of any of the sections within that uh, security and disarmament resolution. And part of it was when we were to testify, we were supposed to debate NATO on the uh, applications of HARP uh, and also on non-lethal weapons. And NATO refused uh, to appear. Um, they said they had no policy on non-lethal weapons and they had no policy on ionospheric modification for weapons uses, which was the stuff of HARP. So we opened the hearing with two, two documents, one called Ionospheric Modification for Weapons Application, produced by NATO France, <laughs> unclassified. Uh, the second document was by the Strategic Studies Institute in London, discussing the deployment of non-lethal weapons for over a year throughout non uh, non, uh, excuse me, NATO Europe. And so what we suggested to the uh, committee, because we certainly wouldn't expect NATO to be lying, um, we said, well, if they don't have a policy, then they're reckless because here's the documents that say they've always deployed these systems. Eight months later, they had a policy on non-lethal weapons developed, um, and it was a year later um, that they announced uh, the abandonment of the ABM treaty, something that we actually predicted in our testimony would be done within a year, it was little less than a year, um, that it was abandoned. And many will remember that. Um, the Europeans couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it when we were testifying that that would actually happen. It was the one point in our testimony that they absolutely objected to um, until nine months later when it happened. And then when our resolution moved forward a few months later, it was all over. I mean, our stuff passed uh, and flew through. 
One of the other places um, that, that this all comes up again uh, in our book Earth Rising 2, sort of the aftermath, because they were going to engage in studies, those studies were completed, and, and it's again a very slow, drawn out process, but this issue is gaining additional currency um, in Europe um, and in the United States. I want to mention um, one other really important paper, and it's um, one that shows up at the U.S. Army War College website. And it's a publication they called Perimeters. And you can look up the article. It's called The Mind Has No Firewalls. And I'll just read one line out of it because it's many pages long. But the one line that's important, a psychotronic generator which produces a powerful electromagnetic emanation capable of being sent through telephone lines, TV, radio networks, supply pipes, and incandescent lamps. This signal would manipulate the behavior of those in contact with the signal, unquote. In other words, any electromagnetic carrier can be used to carry a signal, whether it's your phone lines, your TV, your internet, it doesn't matter, or even, as Persinger pointed out, the magnetic field lines of the Earth itself. This is why it's important. People always ask me, what can we do about this? And the answer is, not enough, because there's no single thing you can do to block out all of the potential carriers for such a signal. There was a um, report that was um, put together by a program called Undercurrents. It's on CBC TV, which is a Canadian public broadcasting network. And Undercurrents ran a segment on mind control years ago. And what they showed is that all the various ways that the Russians were utilizing to send um, signals in. And something that a lot of people don't realize, that the flicker rate, you know, I, I talked about the flicker effect, um, being able to entrain the brain in very few seconds to become um, modified to mirror that external signal. How many have ever looked at a television in a dark room and looked at the white wall behind you and noticed the flicker rate that occurs there? Now, most of it's random. It's just all over the map. Pay attention during the advertisements because when you see a very coherent rhythmic signal, your brain, because you're already passive, because here's how it goes, you come home from work, fatigued, Tired. You remember how the, how, how the Nazis did it? You know, they had all their rallies in the middle of the night and you're during the Depression when everybody's working two or three jobs trying to figure out how to eat. So they get you tired, you come home, the first thing you do is you eat, then you really relax as your body chemistry kicks in. You watch the news, get injected with a good jolt of fear, which gets you even more um, agitated, right? I mean, we all do it. Then you listen to the commercials and get some more fear because you might smell bad, taste bad, look bad. I mean, whatever it is that they're throwing at you, right? All that's going on, and then you're sitting there watching the ads passively. And if you look at what's going on, and advertisers know this because they teach it in psychology coursework today about brain entrainment and frequency following response. Anybody who's developing sophisticated advertising knows if you can maintain the right flicker rate, the brain will become more passive. And then it's not a um, subliminal, it's just the overt words coming across the screen that you're just yeah, that's right, you know, you're just absorbing it like a sponge because most people aren't critically analyzing the data coming in. Simple as that. In Japan, they use um, subliminals, actually, buried on the elevator music, you know, that you hear in department stores. And buried on it in Japan, in many of these department stores, are in seven languages, words to dissuade shoplifters. And they found a 40% reduction in shoplifting. Now, why only 40 percent? Well, just thinking about it myself, I'm thinking, okay, who would you dissuade? Well, the guys who still have a conscience left, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, the little kid going in doing the stupid thing the little kids do, you know, those kinds of situations where, oh, I better not do this. Those that are like, you know, habitual criminals, I mean, they don't, <laughs> they're not paying attention to that. It doesn't matter. So they probably continue to rob whatever they're going to rob, but you get a 40 percent reduction based on those with some conscience. Now imagine flipping this around. What if you had some fluorescent orange socks with green polka dots on aisle six that weren't moving too well? You know, could they be abuse it, misuse it? Would they? Would Walmart do that to you? <laughs> nah. You know, Walmart uh, is going to put in their um, stores where you can walk into these certain zones and hear, hear voices in your head. Have you seen this? Has anybody heard about this yet? Okay, some have, some haven't. It'll be voluntary. So voluntary. You walk in, you get the message, and everybody's entertained by it. But it has a tremendous anchoring effect, number one. Number two is, where are the regulations that prevent this from widespread use? They're non-existing. 
because they don't, they don't apply to technologies of today. I mean, I'll give you a good example. Um, in my state, I had a situation where I had identity theft. Now, they weren't robbing me. They were just trying to crucify me in the Internet. And I went to the police, and the police said, well, you know, we could call it harassment if they'd called you on the phone, talked to you on the, uh, in person, mailed you something, but we don't address the Internet. I mean, they did the next year. We got the legislature to codify it. But in most states, and nationally, a lot of this stuff has not been codified in a way that says, hey, the technology's here. These, this is the box in which you can use this technology. The box has not been uh, well-defined, which, which is a huge problem. When you think of the human mind, and somebody challenged me on this recently, and, 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 I'm, and, and I'm sorry, I, I, I can't buy the challenge. And, and the statement I had made was that free will is something that even God uh, doesn't interfere with. And this guy took exception and says, yeah, God does. I don't, I don't believe that. I think free will is what makes us quite unique uh, as individuals. The idea of someone penetrating our consciousness itself for any purpose that we don't agree with or for any purpose that we don't consent to should be not just civilly illegal, it ought to be criminal. Because you think about basic uh, human rights or constitutional rights, none of them matter if you don't have freedom to think. I mean, consider it. You know, when you look at sort of this direction and, and you see what's going on in the country, you know what happens to the brain when you're engaged in fear? You get incoherent brain patterns, not the kind that will lend themselves to the kind of critical thinking that we need right now. In fact, the kind that run counter to critical thinking, and more importantly, that inhibit those anomalous capabilities of human beings. You know that group of scientists I just described? You know what they all, to a person, have told me? Every one of them, the most important thing about all their learning in their whole lives wasn't one thing about their academic learning. It was intuition. Think about that. That's where all of their great breakthroughs came, and the academic learning just gave them a way to get a formula wrapped around it. And that's it. It's you and I have just as much creative potential as any one of those guys, maybe even more, because we're not straitjacketed by those formulas yet either. You know, and if you think about it, science does change dramatically, usually about every 50 years, and it kind of correlates to the time in which people start dying of old age and their dissertations die with them, <laughs> you know, and the new guys with new ideas can come forward. I mean, we see a little more advances more rapidly today than that, but it still inhibits. There's a lot of gatekeepers on the science that keep things from happening. And this goes back to one of the groups I wanted to mention is the Mankind Research Organization. You know, these guys ran out of Silver Springs, Maryland. I know their Northwest Field Director, or was their Northwest Field Director. All of the 140 plus projects they engaged in happened almost perfectly parallel all of those MKUltra sub-projects. Now, who did they draw on for Mankind Research Unlimited in Silver Springs, Maryland? They grabbed all the mavericks, the, the weirdos in science, if you will, the guys that couldn't really conform to that academic straitjacket yet we're well respected, um, but they're on edge ideas, nobody would fund them. So Mankind Research funded them and made the information available to Central Intelligence, which then exploited it. Um, usually, the scientist was totally unwitting in terms of knowing what they were participating in, and, and I genuinely believe that. I think there's a lot of people get really excited about their science, but because their bandwidth is so narrow because everyone over-specializes, that they really don't get it. And, and this is something Dr. Eastland has pointed out in most of his published work since we challenged his work was instead of saying discount everything, his view is now we need integrated science. We need people to be talking to each other within specialty fields so we can avoid the kind of mistakes that otherwise are going to get made or so we can avoid the intentional misuses of technology that might run counter uh, to what most people uh, see as our uh, joint value systems. Whether right or left, there are certain fundamental things that all of us recognize as absolutely necessary so we can continue to have a vibrant right and left uh, in this country. Because that's what makes the country strong, is the underlying principles that unite us, not those principles that separate us. But the domain of the mind itself is not a domain that the military or the intelligence community should be tapping into. And some of the things that are coming now that are very important, and bef before I go to the breaks, I'm running down now to about 9.20, uh, I want to talk about just a, a couple of these things. I want to mention uh, quantum computing. 
and what that entails, because they just announced in the last few months the capability that we're going to have quantum computers within the next few years commercially available. Now, what does that mean? The uh, biggest computers uh, in the world, the supercomputers of today, one of them was tested June 30th, 2006 at Lawrence Livermore Labs. And what they determined is that it could go 280.6 teraflops a second, which doesn't mean anything to most people in this room. Let me put it in a, in a, in a perspective that will make it have some meaning. In that one second, today's supercomputer, not a quantum computer, but today's supercomputer, can do what 6.6 .6 billion people with a hand calculator, all of us with hand calculators, running a calculation every five seconds for 60 hours will do what that computer can do in one second. That seems just incredible, right? I mean, 60 hours, 6.6 .6 billion people clicking away, I mean, pretty incredible, one second. A quantum computer will do what all, what, what, multiply that one second, expand it into a trillion years, okay? And the quantum computer will do it in an hour. Now think about this, 6.6 .6 billion people all doing all that for 60 hours for one second, one second figured into a trillion years and being able to, to do that in an hour. Now let me tell you what that means. There will be no encryption that can't be broken immediately. There won't be any system that can't be penetrated. In fact, all the systems on the planet with encryption could be jumped into probably in less than a day. And then their data downloaded into a central data bank and sorted and analyzed and have a complete life log, which is a program that just got cut from the Pentagon because that's what they wanted. Your life log from birth to death, every bit of digital data that could be acquired on every individual. Now, quantum computers will do some other things. Quantum computers will also be able to map the brain in three dimensions as thoughts are going on in real time. Now, right now, you need three supercomputers of the modern ones, and I just described what that is. Three of these strung together, and they're doing this in Switzerland this year, to get one neuron firing chain within the human brain. Not the whole brain, just one neuron firing chain in three dimensions. And the idea here is, is once you get it mapped, then you can create a complex signal that can then impose that on someone else. Now, why is that important? Well, with quantum computing, now you get this whole brain mapping. You can, you can take someone with incredible intellectual capacity and their thought is, is then to transfer this, to download directly into another brain knowledge and information. Well, we can get all excited about that as long as we're in control of the curriculum, right? Well, in this country, when you think about how these things will migrate, they're going to migrate into public school systems eventually, 20 years from now. We'll see it maybe sooner. Who's going to control that curriculum? And remember what I said about root beliefs. When you start dumping information in in this way and you create conflicts in the root belief systems, you've got huge potential problems. But the military is actively looking at this for a number of reasons. That, that there's one that just, I, I, I had forgotten even that I quoted this, and it, and it showed up, um, I mentioned it in, in radio recently, and I'll, as I flip through here, I'll try and find it. But it was um, a discussion about uh, mind uh, mapping, mind printing is what they called it. And the idea of mind printing uh, shows up in the literature back in the mid-90s, and the idea was, I can't find the quote, it's an earth rising, the revolution, but it's the, the guys figured out that they could map the brain and use it for interrogation. And they said it was 100% accurate so that if somebody had knowledge of a crime, for instance, they could put crime scene photos in front of them and certain things would trigger in the brain. They could literally read your mind. The, and then they believe with 100% confidence, say, yeah, you know all this, even though you're not verbalizing it. I mean, I don't like this idea. You know, I mean, talk about 1984 looks like uh, simple stuff compared to what, you know, what we're talking about here. But they've talked about using this kind of technology. It showed up in a publication called Signal Intelligence for using similar things in airports. So that when you walk through this tower, it'll read your general emotional state. And if you're a little stressed, and a lot of people are when you hear, orange alert, orange alert, thank you for your cooperation. You know, my wife's sick of me saying it because every time I go to the airport, I just get irritated because I'm not cooperating, I'm being coerced, <laughs> you know? I mean, you don't have a choice. You don't want to go to jail. You know, it's, 
Thank you for your cooperation as you watch these people that couldn't catch a terrorist if their life depended on it, searching your bags. You know, I mean, come on. How many have ever traveled in and out of Europe, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, before all this? They have better security then than we have now. I mean, it's ridiculous. But the fact is, in this environment of fear and discomfort, on a national level, what kinds of things happen? Well, you get bills like the Patriot Act that 99 U.S. senators sign off on. One of them says, wait a minute. And then later, over 300 local and state governments say, hey, you made a mistake. And instead of fixing the mistake, they just reenact another version of the Patriot Act. You know, when you think about what all of it entails, is, is where, is it, where is it really going and where are they really headed, it's towards a more directed um, and controlled society. Ultimately, uh, that's where it goes. You know, I want to uh, get back into the, the other side of, of this issue, and I'll, I want to mention a couple of things. You know, people always ask me, are there some things that, you know, that we can do? What, what about our, you know, our natural uh, environments? What are the things that we might do that will improve um, our, our human performance? And I just want to mention a couple of things to get it into perspective. Uh, you know, think back on the last time, and I know you guys experienced this down here in California, is the last time you had a power failure. And the first thing you notice is your, your air conditioners or heaters aren't working, so everything is pretty quiet. But most people also, if you stop and think about it and reflect on it, you'll notice almost your whole body goes whew, like a big exhale. Same feeling that you get when you go out into the country and, and get out of the city, get out of that urban uh, environment. You know, your body is constantly uh, cr trying to create equilibrium for the uh, magnetic fields uh, that are impacting us all the time. You know, I mentioned radio frequency energy alone. When you think about the 60 cycles that surrounds us, the pulse rate of our power grid, if you will, um, all of that creates sort of an underlying agitation and stress. I'll tell you where you really notice it. How many um, uh, uh, people here lived or originated from New York City? Do we have anybody? Okay, we got a few. Most New Yorkers go back, and, and the reason they end up back in the city usually is they say, I just didn't feel right. Something didn't feel right. They leave the city, and what it is, is you leave that environment of sort of being born into this explosion of energy, and all of a sudden it's gone. There is something definitely uh, missing. You're no longer having to make up for this um, equilibrium. You know, when you think about uh, the body itself, uh, what do you do when you get home at night? Usually the first thing you do is you kick off your shoes, you know, because you're insulated from the power uh, grid of the earth, if you will. The earth has a natural frequency. It's called Schumann's resonance. It was uh, discovered back in the 50s uh, in Munich, Germany, and it was 7.83 hertz, 7.83 pulses per second. Now there's some folks going around saying it's increasing. Um, it's not. Um, at least throughout all the 90s and all the years that that rumor was out there, UCLA right here monitored Schumann's resonance every 15 minutes, and there was no appreciable change uh, in it, and even if there was a change, something that was discovered in the 1950s, how can you figure on what that change would mean um, just to 40 or 50 years later? I mean, we have no long-term observation about what it means, except for one, one, one or two things. First of all, 7.83 hertz happens to be in that ideal zone, if you will, the alpha range, where you want to be in your most creative and analytical states of waking consciousness. Kind of makes sense you know, that our bodies and minds would lock on to the planet's uh, rhythms themselves and they would have some meaning for us. Um, but when you mask them in a background noise of electromagnetic fields that we've created that sort of overlap, overlay them, we lose um, a lot of that perspective. How many remember seeing the um, Discovery uh, Channel special on the I Iceman? Did anybody see that? There's a few hands, okay. The Iceman, when they discovered him, and many will remember this, in northern Italy or southern Germany, I guess, depending on whose side of the argument you want to be on, they find this guy in a glacier, frozen, been there 5,000 years, they figure, and they start to do the autopsy, and they notice that he has all these tattoos, and someone doing the autopsy said, hey, those tattoos correlate to acupuncture points and meridians. And so they look at all the guy's disorders, and lo and behold, his disorders also line up with those acupuncture points and meridians. And so then there's this big discussion, well, how did they get all this information from China to here in Europe or from Europe, because now this predates Chinese acupuncture, at least as we thought about it by a couple thousand years, how did it get over there? 
How about this theory, and I want to say theory real, real loud. What if, when you strip away all the background noise, maybe you and I and others, or sensitive individuals, could actually pick out these unique points on the human body by measuring um, some difference on the surface of the skin? Is that possible? Well, it is, um, actually. And I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I've told this story often, but it's um, one of my mentors, Rayo Michaela, was studying uh, at the University of Queensland Human Movement Studies at one point, and he began charting um, electrical properties on the surface of the skin. He finished charting them all, and his daughter, it turns out it was his daughter, came into the room and said, Dad, why do you have an acupuncture chart on the wall? And he said, No, this is my work. I've been doing this for two years. Next day, she brings in, you know, one of those ancient Chinese pictures, you know, showing all the points. Same points. What he did, and I'm, and I'm showing this tool, this is a um, a pointer plus two of the guys asked me if I brought them and I, I forgot to bring the ones that I, I normally market but it has two functions it has a, an on and off switch and a power level for sending energy in and then it has a sensitivity switch for measuring what's going on on the surface of the skin it's got a metal plate here and a metal probe here and when I find an acupuncture point for instance there's one on the index finger when I find it I get an auditory signal and a light flashing. Can you all see that? And if I depress the trigger, let me get the power up a little. If I depress the trigger, send a little bit of energy in, what will happen is we rebalance those energy meridians, rebalance uh, the energy flowing through that point. What will happen when I release the trigger and I'm no longer sending energy and I ought to get a much stronger audible signal and a much stronger or solid uh, light, which indicates the energy is flowing correctly, which is exactly what we get. What it does is it measures skin differentials on surface skin just so happens that you can locate every um, acupuncture point. You know, you can find them even when you can't see them. You can find them with precision because everybody has these points, but you know what? They don't, enter, they don't line up with your nervous system or your circulatory system or your muscle or tissue systems. They are separate a different energy system for the distribution across the body. And what has been shown is that utilizing electric current or needling, the old method, you know, that all of you are thrilled about, you know, getting those needles jammed in you. The problem with um, needling is if you miss by a millimeter or two, or the angle is not quite right, you get no effect. With an electromagnetic field, it's the magnetic field that's important, and you see the probe is about three millimeters in diameter and then from uh, about three millimeters on either side you get a pretty effective magnetic field. So once you locate the point you never miss. You always affect it. With lasers, cold lasers, they found that even more profound effect can occur because you can pump energy in to those points in a very dr dramatic way. But the fact is they can be measured. So what happens when you strip away all the background noise? And I believe that within every society, within every culture, we're certain individuals with enough sensitivity to be able to locate those points and integrate them into healing. Obviously, the Europeans were doing it 5,000 years ago. The Chinese were doing it thousands of years ago. And we don't think they had instruments like this to make those determinations. Um, but perhaps human beings, certain human beings, those that became the shaman within their cultures or the healers within their cultures actually knew this. Interesting stuff. One of the other devices, and I just show this just as an example, this one just detects. This one has a little more sensitivity. You've got to again complete a loop, but you can find uh, the points with some uh, degree of, of accuracy. And again, you get a, a feedback. These are important um, for demonstrating the principles, for understanding that we do uh, integrate and, and moderate energy in unique ways. And in fact, by manipulating that energy, some pretty unique things can happen. Acupuncture is well recognized now. Even in some states, insurance now covers it. Uh, mainly they talk about it for pain reduction, those kinds of applications. But they have used uh, acupuncture for much, much more than that. Um, one of the other things that we've talked about, and I want to mention it in the context of sort of where we left off. You know, we were leaving off in the last conversation before the break. We talked about quantum computers and what that meant for brain mapping. Um, I want to talk about some of the ways, and somebody asked me during the break, you know, what about, are there ways, what's the worst case scenario on mind control? And okay, I, I can give you a couple of them. Uh, one worst case scenario that we use the magnetic field lines of the planet itself to pacify people. 
That would be a pretty worst case. You know, I had somebody say to me, well, wouldn't it be great if we could just make everybody happy? It sounds like Jose Delgado, you know, towards a psycho-civilized society, because he thought that was a good idea. I personally don't think that's a good idea. I think every emotion that we as human beings experience, we need to experience. You know, if, if, if I look around the room and I say it in almost every lecture, those that have a little bit of gray hair and even those that don't know that the times when you learn the most, when you grow the most as a human being, aren't in the good times, they're usually in the rough times. And I think that's why it is important to have the full spectrum of emotions, or the, the, the triggers, the warnings, the signals that help us grow as human beings and become perhaps more complete as human beings as we gain mastery over our emotions and our intellects. Um, they're not meant to run wild. You know, when you think about the environment of fear being created all around us, what is it intended to do? It's intended to keep you from thinking in the way that people who do not experience fear think. The ways that lead to good government, the ways that lead to a different economy, the ways that lead to better um, existence for every one of us. It's, it's through the consciousness itself. An environment of fear doesn't do it. Um, a couple of other breakthroughs that have come through recently that relate to this issue that come up all the time, RFID tags. Everyone's heard about them. The newest ones, uh, there was a couple of them, one by Hitachi that's only 100, and, I believe it's 128 bits, pretty small in terms of data storage, a few digits, you know, basically a serialized number, but it was one half the width of a human hair, pretty small. Now there was another one announced just a few weeks later earlier this year that has 168,000 bits of data can be stored on it, a little bit more information, but it's the size of a human cell. That's small, ladies and gentlemen. That is like a one two thousandths of an inch minus, you know, very, very small. Now, RFID tags, they say, oh, no problem, you know, you got to be close to the reader or walk through the tower at the department store. Not true. We've been saying it for years, and in the very end of um, last year, 2006, at the Las Vegas um, Electronics Show, they announced a new method for energizing these and also charging up your cell phone at a distance so you never need to charge it again, called magnetic induction. It goes back to the ideas of Nikola Tesla and uh, Faraday. Magnetic induction, the idea of sending energy out into the environment in a way that you can then tap into it. And what they did is they figured out a way to do this with only 2% loss of energy, which is about the same as you get running energy through the power grid, through the power systems that exist today. Now, why is it important? How do they want to use it? A couple of places. One, they can activate now um, uh, an RFID tag from up to two kilometers away. Think about that. Two kilometers a day away, they can activate an RFID tag. Now, in terms of magnetic induction, where they want to use these, they want to install them on um, every cell tower in the country and in the world so that you won't have to worry about charging up your battery anymore for your cell phone. It will be sort of part of the service. Okay, now the difference is every cell phone has GPS built in so they know exactly where you are when you make a call. The old way you used to avoid that is you took the battery out. That won't work anymore. The other thing that you need to know about cell phones is they have what are called roving wiretaps. A U.S. Supreme Court case just got one where they got to use evidence generated in this way where they go in, say there's a, in this case it was a mafioso guy in a restaurant and he's sitting at the table and so they couldn't get a good mic on him so they downloaded software into every cell phone in the room and activated them all simultaneously so they all acted as microphones even when they were switched off. So no matter where they were in the room, they were picking up the conversations and being able to segregate them based on voice recognition software that could ID the people talking. They used it as evidence and it was upheld uh, in the courts. So, you know, you think about things like OnStar in your car and cell phones as a matter of safety, but you also think about it as mechanisms of manipulation and control. Because remember what I said about quantum computers? Think about all the data that's already stored. You know, it's it used to be privacy sort of ended at our threshold of our doorway to our homes. There's less information about us probably in our homes today than there is in databases stored all over the world. You know, your digital doorway is your doorway for privacy in the 21st century, and that digital doorway is not protected. In fact, it's, it, it, is, it is violated by people all the time in, in forms of identity theft, which is the most overt, 
to government collection of data for security purposes, which we every once in a while we get the little blip in the news about them tapping all your domestic phone calls and tapping all your foreign calls. And, but all that data is stored. Now, it doesn't mean much because you can't sort it yet. But as soon as you can, everything changes. Because the data, data storage is cheap, as all of you know, and getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, but that amount of information being available, being able to sort it, is what is coming that changes everything. You know, when you talk about advances in technology, they change. Now it's about every nine months. Everything doubles from the invention of the wheel to where we are right now. With quantum computers, it'll be every day or two. Think about that. Every day or two. How could we even begin to catch up with what's happening? We can't. So we need umbrella kinds of legislation now that sets broad perimeters of what is not permitted and the criminal, not civil, but criminal prosecutions that ought to go with it because we're talking about the very essence of, of who we are as human beings in terms of us physiologically and all of the data ever stored about us which represents truly uh, the dimensions of privacy uh, in the 21st century. I want to mention um, a couple of more uh, uh, things that are, in, that are important. Uh, does anybody have a cell phone sitting around here in the front row? Because I want to just demonstrate this quickly. If you'll bring it up, uh, this, is, um, this thing uh, uh, detects um, microwave radiation, and it's an electrosmog detector. And generally, with a, with a cell phone, you don't get much until you activate it. I'm just going to push a number on this one if we're on. Okay, I'll kick it on. Come on, Verizon, do your thing. All right. Now, if I hit a button to make a call, well, it's a little slower than... Okay, I'm going to hit a button. That's what... This is just giving you an idea. As soon as you get away from it, the energy that you put into your head with a microwave device and the reason I, I talk about cell phones fairly often is it's the one time that we've stuck a microwave transmitter next to our head. And what we're doing is transferring heat. And it does have an effect. Um, that effect's been measured and been demonstrated. There's a number of articles um, that have been written about it. Every once in a while you hear people say, oh, everything's wonderful, everything's safe. It's not just the energy coming off of a cell phone. It's the whole idea that as a step along a way of a more directed and controlled society, you know there's 23 million households now in the United States that, that only have a cell phone as their primary means of communication. What's unique about it, how many saw the recent thing on the um, billboards that will look at your eye as you're going by to recognize how long you're looking at it? Have you, did you see those articles in the last week or so? Anyway, new invention. So when you look at the billboard, it looks at your retina and makes the register of how long you looked at it. And when you're carrying a cell phone that's uniquely coded to you, the way these things will integrate is they'll know it's you personally that gazed at that for that amount of time. And then the little text message that comes to you for the advertising will be tailored based upon your interaction with your environment, as an example. When you walk through the department store with your uh, cell phone or your RFID tag in the shirt that you bought from them a while back and you start looking at displays, all that data is useful for creating patterns for marketing you later. Think about um, government as information is developed um, and individual information is developed. Life log, what the Pentagon wanted. How would that be abused? Uh, well, you can get some, you've heard of racial profiling. This is whole population profiling and you can get very sophisticated on it. So say there's a candidate running for office who has ten major issues and you disagree strongly with nine of them, but one of those issues is your issue. That is probably the only issue you're ever going to hear come from that candidate. And this is going to come in the next few years because they're going to be able to tailor those messages based on what you already believe based upon profiles that can be deduced by your information footprint across the planet. Now it won't be 100% accurate, but it doesn't need to be. Because if it's 90 or 80% accurate, it's enough to swing elections. And think about it. It used to be about getting all the information so you can make conclusions that were rational. Now it'll be about restricting information and containing information so you just get that which you're most likely to respond favorably to. 
This is why these issues, whether it's that subtle kind of manipulation or something much more sophisticated, why we need to start paying attention, why we need some regulation, and what we don't need is an environment of fear that limits human capacity at a time when we need the opposite. Yeah, there's scary things going on in the world. When hasn't there been? And yeah, there's potential for big risks, and there are going to be big problems in the United States. I can guarantee you that, especially with the kinds of things we're doing overseas. This type of technology, as it's being advanced, is being advanced because we're afraid of what other people think, and we would like to regulate that. I don't think we should be. I think we ought to start reflecting more on the character of the country and recognize that people should be free to think. You know, in, in Iraq right now, if they want a theocracy, who are we to say they don't deserve one? If that's their outcome of self-determination. You know, that's what this country was based on, was self-determination, not democracy. Self-determination that would be revisited from time to time. And we started with a democratic republic. Democracy is not even reflected in the Constitution. It's a republic. It's something quite different. Democracy was always thought of as mob rule, you know. So we have these perceptions about what we're doing over there. But if I were in the Middle East, and if I were in Iraq, and I first watched my country get run over, I'd be a little upset. But I'd be even more upset by watching my state-run oil company get privatized, hijacked for the private sector. You know, think about this, ladies and gentlemen. What are we doing there? Why are we there? And what right do we have to impose our form of government on anyone? Stay in your box, stay within your boundaries, and have whatever government you want. I think that's what this country was based upon when we started, was non-interference. You look at our government, what we're doing around the world, interfering with people's governments routinely, historically, always. We all know this. If any one government that we did this to did it to us, we would be literally and are up in arms. And yet we do it all the time. The blowback is here. That's what the CIA always called it, blowback, because it comes back on you and haunts you in future generations, and we're seeing that today. Mind control initiatives now and non-lethal weapons initiatives now are about pacifying populations. The sad story is funding for these advances in non-lethal weapons according to protocols between the Department of Defense and Department of Justice that we trace in, in this book. It's about limiting uh, what we do, limiting what we know, and not allowing a free-flowing uh, society. And in fact, the advances, the funding, is given a priority if you can use it against your foreign adversaries and domestically. And it comes up September 13th, last year. There was an article in the papers, hit the AP wire service. It was uh, Secretary of the Air Force Wynne, W-Y-N-N-E, who said, that we needed to test all our non-lethal weapons on Americans first just so the rest of the world wouldn't criticize us when we put them into combat zones. I don't like this idea. And I don't really like this idea coming from the guy that's running the Air Force because I resent that mindset. I resent the mindset of the U.S. Army War College when they published in the Revolution of Military Affairs and Conflict Short of War in 1989 that there were all these new technologies, some of which we've covered today, coming and that they would be resisted by Americans because they violate our very fundamental values. And instead of the U.S. Army War College, that is institution training Army officers to say, well, I guess that's out of bounds. Instead, they said the way we bring these technologies forward, this is in 1989, mind you, is with an environment of fear predicated on international terrorism and international drug trafficking. Now think about it, since 1989, how many column inches have been dedicated to those subjects? Now, it's a lot of people. You know, we lose more people in traffic accidents in the United States every year than we've lost in tourism in the last, or terrorism in the last uh, 10. If you add up all the deaths from terrorism in the last 10 years, you might get 10,000 people. If you include everyone that's died in Afghanistan and Iraq on our side, it seems like a lot of people, and it is. But if you compare it to medical malpractice, according to Harvard in the same 10 years in the United States, a million Americans have died. Yet, what do we see in the news every day, whipping up our fear? It's not going to the doctor, which ought to generate a lot more nervousness these days than terrorism, but we don't think about it. And you know, most of that with doctors is medical um, prescription interactions, drug interactions. Half the deaths are related to that. Now, these aren't disabilities, these are deaths. Half of them, uh, drug interactions that could be database centrally, 
easily if it were protected and you were secured with your medical records and you could avoid almost all of that uh, kind of death. You know how much it would cost? A whole lot less than the half a trillion dollars we're spending uh, in the Gulf and Afghanistan. And the reason I resent what's going on there rebuilding countries, personally why I resent it, is in my home state of Alaska, 34 percent of our rural villages don't have running water yet. They still use a honey bucket and go down to a sewage lagoon every day. You know, this is in the United States, ladies and gentlemen, and we have no business building anybody's infrastructure for the last five years and trying to build up a military that obviously doesn't want us there. We spent 12 weeks training our men and women to go there. Five years is long enough. If they don't want democracy, let them have whatever revolution they need. And just stay in your own box. And if they want to come out of the box and, and threaten our, and legitimately threaten our interests, then blow them back into the Stone Age again, as far as I'm concerned. But the fact is, they deserve their sovereignty within their boundaries, just like we do. And we need to start developing a foreign policy that says, we don't interfere. And when we do, we make sure they know it. You know, we don't do it through preemptive warfare. And the reason we shouldn't be doing it through preemptive warfare is these technologies we've been talking about don't have to originate here. They can originate anywhere on this planet. When you're talking about energy-based technologies, they travel at the speed of light, 186,300 miles per second, seven times around the planet in a second with time left over. Preemptive warfare and this type of technology don't bode well. We're the top dog today, but we may not be tomorrow. The mind is the area of where we need not inhibiting technologies, but technologies advance our potentials. You know, there was a, a question that was raised during the break on uh, uh, how to enhance human performance. One of the things that comes out all the time is neurobiofeedback or brain biofeedback. Very simple stuff. I didn't bring the tools with me this time, but I, I carry a device that's called the Antens Alpha Trainer. Real simple device, has three probes that fit on the forehead, three metal discs. They measure muscle tension. Because whenever we're stressed, these muscles always tense up. Then it has a, a headset and a sound. It starts out real high. As your mind slows and the rhythm increases, you get a lower and lower signal. And the idea is, by getting real feedback, in other words, just the opposite of what I was describing earlier. Frequency following response is light or sound or electromagnetic field, something driving the brain, pushing the brain into a specific area. In this case, you're just looking at what you're already doing yourself. And as you change what you do, the tone changes. For little kids, what they have now is they have these cool little helmets. They look like bicycle helmets, and they put them in front of a computer screen, and they have a guy that's running a race. And every time their brain hits that alpha range where they want them for ideal learning, their guy starts to get ahead. Now, they use these with kids with attention deficit disorders, kids that are hyperactive, they use it in 40 school districts in the United States today out of 15,000. <laughs> you know, so it's only a small number. But in the places where they've used it, up to 80% of the student population that were previously on Ritalin or other psychoactive drugs, within 30 to 40 days don't need them anymore. They don't need the equipment either anymore because once they've done this for an hour a day, 30 to 40 sessions, they learn how to moderate their brain activity into that ideal zone. They're also using it for stroke recovery. They're using it for addictive behaviors, attention deficit disorders, hyperactivity, or just enhancing your own personal brain performance. Very, very simple technologies. More sophisticated uh, science is out there, I mean, in terms of what can be used, but when you think about it, th and this is a big, a big deal. It started with the Bush administration. When I talk about mind control, you've got to go back, even back further to the 1970s, where they first started talking about going into schools public schools, and this is in the congressional record, we cite it in, in this book, Controlling the Human Mind, where they wanted to go in and start medicating kids in mass. And it kind of died in the Congress, went away, came back during the Bush-Reagan years, and they were going to try it again with a $400 million initiative. They got all the big uh, psychological associations of the country to buy in, and they were getting ready to do this. And what they were going to do is go into the inner city schools and first look at the kids that were acting out, non-conforming personalities, then they were going to test them, then they were going to interview the parents, and then they were going to start drugging them. Now, 
That got wiped out because one of the heads of one of these psychiatric uh, associations, of psychiatrists rather, started referring to inner city use as monkeys and uh, everybody took offense to it and the initiative died. And it died by the initiative of a guy named Bregan, uh, Dr. Bregan in uh, M uh, Maryland was pushing against this issue and killed it. Showed up again in the 1990s, late 90s, and it was on the cover of um, U.S. Uh, News and World Report. And you might remember the cover, it was a little baby in a, a striped prison uniform trying to associate crime with genetics. The you know, last time they did this, I think, was during the uh, Nazi regime in Germany, actually. Uh, but this kind of concept that it was genetically based and that we needed to medicate the whole population. Here's the problem. You know those kids that are non-conforming in those schools? Those are the future leadership or criminals, depending on the direction they take, but the same characteristics manifest at an early age. Non-conformity, questioning authority, raising questions that some teachers feel uncomfortable because it challenges their intellect. And so they want to shut them up, you know? I was one of those kids. I mean, I didn't get in trouble so much. I mean, I did a little bit, I suppose. But I didn't conform. Um, but I would have been one of those kids they would have drugged up because I didn't conform, you know? And I, I saw things a little bit differently. Everybody who does anything unique, I can tell you it never springs from the status quo. This is exactly the wrong approach. The right approach is to analyze those kids that act out and get the right educators behind them to get that energy channeled in a different direction that is productive rather than destructive. And that can be done by good educators and good family structures, not by drugging kids. Uh, the, the thing that's exciting about neurobiofeedback and brain biofeedback is kids learn within 30 to 40 sessions how to do it themselves. Now there's a big advantage for all of us in that whether we know any kids like this or not. The big advantage is they're the biggest shortage in educators in the country right now are special education teachers. Uh, the second biggest problem is the budgets associated with special ed education. I worked in education, my wife worked in special ed for 11 years, and it's the biggest problem. And so if you can really solve these things, not with symptom treatment, but real curative reshaping of the brain by their own activity, we should see every school district involved in this because it's teaching kids just like learning to ride a bike. Try and do it from a book. Good luck. Get on it and fall down two or three times until you figure it out and then set that bike aside and don't pick it up for 20 years and some of you guys like me have done this, got back on one and away you go. You never forget. It's laid down in those neuro pathways in the brain in such a way where you never forget. The same is true here. We can teach kids, we can teach adults, we can teach each other how to moderate our brain activity for higher performance at a time when we truly need it. And, and I think that's the direction that we should start to see more educational initiatives in because it is in freeing the mind and looking at consciousness itself, looking at the higher attributes of what human beings are. And that's where the real change comes in. I want to give one, um, one example, and I, and I started searching this guy out. Because telepathy was always an intriguing thing for me as a young kid. You know, I'd read, um, how many read Ostrander and Schroeder's work uh, back in the 70s? Psyche Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain. Great book. If you can find it, it's been revised, actually. There's a new version out um, after the fall of the Soviet Union. So it's got a lot more information. But as a kid of about 13, I read the book. Got really excited. Very interesting stuff. And then I met a guy I'd gone to school with, all through school with. And he had had an experience, and it was at the time in my life where I was studying all of this, and I ran into him after school was out. We'd graduated and gone on and done our thing, and I saw him, and, and it was years ago, I was, in fact, 30 years ago. I ran into him on the street, told him what I was studying, and he goes, boy, that's interesting. He goes, I know what people think. And I went, yeah, come on, you know, get out of here. He goes, no, no, I really do. You know, let's sit down, we'll talk about it. I says, well, first, having read in the area, some things showed up. And I, first thing I asked him is, did you have any trauma? Because oftentimes, anomalous brain activity kicks in gear in trauma. You know, because you need some other resource, and so the body kicks in, and the mind kicks in, and you get these strange attributes. So the first thing he says is, yeah, I did. And he explains the breakup of his girlfriend after six years. I said, so what happened? He goes, well, I had this thing where I was outside of my body looking at myself. And that's 30 years ago. And so I said, oh, astral projection. We didn't have out-of-body, because OBEs weren't the words used then. It was astral, astral projection. So, well, that's interesting, and that correlates with some of the stuff that shows up in the literature. And I said, so what started happening? He goes, well, 
Whenever I get in a very relaxed state, which again makes sense because the brain activity slows, falls into the proper ranges, he goes, I know what people think, and he got, he got real uncomfortable walking into groups of so-called friends and finding out that they really weren't my friends. That's a pretty heavy thing to be thinking about. And you know, I didn't see him then for two years. And the next time I saw him, guess where he was? He was working in a daycare facility with little kids. Couldn't stand being around adults anymore. It was a curse, you know, it wasn't a gift. Um, but being around little kids, it was great because they're pretty innocent, you know, I mean, they don't have any hostile stuff, and whatever's hostile in a five-year-old's mind it certainly isn't hostile in an adult's mind in most cases. But he was able to direct kids. But here's what he demonstrated to me, and this is where I became a, a believer, and then seeing the um, evidence of it years and years later, most recently Alex's work giving the mathematics, he said, think of anything. Picture anything in your mind. Just hold the picture for a few seconds. I'm thinking about something, and he goes, November 10th, 1958, it's your birth date, it's circled on a calendar, and on the calendar is a winter scene, and then he described everything in that scene. You know, down to the house, the fence, the snow, the trees, the lakes, the sled, the whole deal. And that for me, the odds, the statistical inference of figuring that one out, forget it. You know, you just can't do it. The date, maybe, you know, maybe he knew it from before, but the whole picture, no chance. Now thinking about that, what would happen? You know, and, I, and this is where it started to really affect me when I think about government advancements in this area and what they discovered. I think they discovered these underlying capabilities weren't just in unique individuals, they're in all of us. Now what would make government more nervous than being totally transparent? They got a lot to hide because there would be a lot of people that should be hung by the neck for what they've done. And, and it's a sad state because we all know it. I mean, we all intellectually know it. We've seen enough evidence over the years come up in one guy's expose after another. But there's no clear system for accountability in any of this. Um, and, and the real systems of accountability need to be developed for the 21st century. We need real whistleblower laws that apply to the private sector when they violate civil liberties or these underlying principles that are basic to who human beings are. We need a different system of regulation to address the technologies of the 21st century so that we have a free democratic republic here in this country and so we have free thinking no matter what governments manifest in the rest of the world. Who are we to impose our will on anyone? You know, the, the, the changes that are coming, the things that are coming are going to make what we've seen in our lifetimes seem like an abacus, <laughs> you know? Seem like the, like the first generation word processor, you know? An ink pen, <laughs> in comparison to the technologies that we're gonna see in our lifetimes. How those technologies advance, where those technologies advance, and when we break down the secrecy syndromes of our governments and other governments that have hidden from us the truth, we're entitled to that truth. The truth may not be comfortable, and I think in the context of whistleblowing, we need to follow the model that was successfully followed in South Africa. Let's establish those truth commissions. Let's let people come forward. And let's do one of the, the second highest human at attribute besides love is forgiveness. Let's forgive in exchange for the truth and then let's reform this system so the 21st century becomes the century of the mind, the intellect, and freedom in a way that we have never, ever contemplated before. And with that, it is 1025. Thank you all for being here.